What is modern style? There's nothing. When the moment it becomes a style, it's not modern anymore. You know, modern has no style. Modern is not style. Modern is a, 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 a discipline. <laughs> modern is, a, is an attitude. It's a way of being. Our job is to spread the notion of quality as much as possible. That is our mission. I might ask Leila, what do you think of it, you know, uh, at the end? Or we might talk about that particular project at the beginning and uh, seeing which options we might have, which direction we might discuss the direction. Or, or I might do something and show it to Leila, and Leila might say, it's wrong. And I, if she says it's wrong, I, I don't even argue because I know that she's right. <laughs> you know, because we have been working together for such a long time. So she, she knows what is right and what is wrong. The success of our marriage is due to the fact that we work together. <laughs> because, you know, we are married for 50 years this year. <laughs> so that says something. That years ago, when we were young, and you're, you're, um, you're not so secure of yourself, you know, you don't know if you do the right thing, it was always much more a battle. Now, instead, it really works completely seamless. And that is very comfortable. At this point, we really work together very well, you know, on that. You know, after 50 years that we work together, we really reach a good position. <laughs> Most of the time, I suppose people think that, that we have a, you know, a pencil and with two hands you know, going together. It isn't really that. You know. uh, collaboration is really a symbiosis of minds, in a sense. I mean, it's two minds that are used to work together. In, and that is what collaboration is all about. Our process of working is by subtraction more than a, by addition. So when we start a project and we have sort of a starting point of design, you know, we try very much to refine it and to be sure that it is the right thing and the subtracting, charge, changing, giving slight change, but really working in refinement instead of trying to do a new thing, completely new. And this is one of the things that now is happening instead with the, most of the young design, that they are trying to distinguish by, by themselves by doing strange things. Things that are not needed, uh, things that are trendy and all this kind of thing. And especially in product design, like furniture or other things, things that didn't exist before, you know, that are different. We always have instead the philosophy that you can try to do things different, either because the technology is different and then, you know, you have a reason to, to use it in a different way, or because you do something that really is improving on what it is around. Like you design a chair that for some reason is an improvement. If it is a, not an improvement, don't do it. It's not necessary. Designers working within a framework like that, they have to understand that the best they can do is by interpreting what the rules are and what the problem is, here, is. Not just do what they want to do just by themselves. It's how well they can play the instrument. Pianists do that. It's very important that designers understand their responsibility they have toward the, themselves, toward the clients, and toward the society in general. You know, I don't like design that doesn't show that kind of responsibility. Design that is too much me, me, me kind of stuff, you know, instead of solving a kind of a problem that a client poses to the designer. This is the difference between arts and design. Arts is not utilitarian, design is utilitarian. 
art doesn't have any limit, you know, or any, but design should. <laughs> so you have a responsibility toward the client to solve this problem, as I said, and then in general the client has a responsibility toward the society, so it could be a service, it could be a subway sign is a social responsibility of informing the, the, the travelers, the user of the subway, uh, in such a way that he doesn't get lost. <laughs> You know, somehow. That is the responsibility that the designer has, the client has, you know, and so on and so forth. On anything, anything. You know, there are beautiful examples, for instance, that the Apple computer is beautiful. You look at the other computers, they're ugly. So, why? Because it happens that that company is very sensitive to the notion of quality. And because of that, they do whatever they do it with a great level of intellectual elegance, you know. Uh, we go back to the same thing, and whatever they do is very consistent, so it has a lot of discipline. And uh, this is why we look at the Mac and we say how beautiful it is. The choice of the materials, the choice of the colors, the iPod, the iPhone, all these things. Every, the iStores are great. I mean, the Apple stores are terrific, you know. Why? Because the, there is a company, probably the best one in the world from that point of view, <coughs> that has a very deep sense of, of uh, social responsibility and uh, commitment to world quality. Quality is something that, you know, we always had a great respect for, <laughs> against quantity really. We might have one coat for two years or three years, you know, especially in the difficult moments, but it has to be the best that it was possible. We were not going for something junky, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and, and that so I learned to appreciate really the quality of fabrics, the quality of furniture, the quality you know, that, that you have around. Even if it's less things, but the right things. Some people have no sense of quality. And uh, some people have a, a real sense of quality in whatever they do, you know, no matter what. It could be a farmer, it could be a scientist, it could be an artist. Whatever they do, we do, they do it with a sense of quality. And there are people also in these three different areas. They're only interested in quantity, usually of money. <laughs> On this wall we have uh, books about graphic design and magazines, past issues and, and then uh, we go more on this side. Well, on that corner, there are book about books about graphic design criticism and essays. Then we move here, there are books about product design and glass and silver and architecture and interiors and, you know, and it keeps going <laughs> all the way. And again, on this side, these colorful spines are again magazine design, I mean, uh, architectural uh, books for whom I design the format, architectural magazines, you know, so uh, again, it's another story. And mix it and there, there are other books I've done also. <laughs> and uh, along the other corridor over there, all those books are reference books. It's not that I like books, of course I do, but it, they seem to come to me. <laughs> I do like books, yeah, that's why. But really, I have no more room, so I have to restrain myself from buying books <laughs> as much as, as I can. But it's very hard to resist that. <laughs> books, 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 it never ends, never ends. What we will do next, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, they keep coming. <laughs> yeah. On that shelf is the train that we designed for the Great Northeastern Railway that goes from London to Scotland. And, uh, you know, it's all in that very dark blue with that uh, slice of red. Of course, we did also the interior of the train, not only the livery, but uh, the first class and the tourist class. Okay. Interior of the train. So <laughs> and we did, of course, all the graphics and so on, you know, the logo, the chromotype, you know, logotype, chromotype, Everything. the whole thing. It's been a... Um, Fun job. Large job. In the uniforms as well. Complete job. It's fun. <laughs> well, intellectual elegance is something that you can refine continuously by education, by cultivating your brain, cultivating your soul, you know. 
It's important to read, it's important to hear music, it's important to consider the difference between Bach and, and Verdi. Just as oh, Bach and Beethoven, Bach and Mozart, you know. And uh, what is the difference? You begin to think about that, and it's the same kind of difference that you will find in architecture between art, one architect and another one, or one designer, graphic designer, and another graphic designer. You know, and you have to learn to be, to have a critical mind, because only through a critical mind you can sharpen your creativity and become a creative mind. There is not such a thing like a good creative mind that has no critical mind. It's not, not in, the, in this kind of professions, at least. You need knowledge and uh, you need criticism. This is why I say all the time, you know, the three most important things, theory, history and criticism. The three things are continuously related and one is feeding the other. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> theory is what gives um, generates a, a, a product. Criticism is what controls it, and history is what makes you the possibility, gives you the possibility of evaluating all these things. So you see that they are really interconnected, the three of them, and you need all of them. University level of education is extremely important for graphic design. Why? because it gives you the amount of time to learn how important are all these things I've been t saying before. Because you have time to study history of, of art and architecture and, and design, much more than you can do on, on, a, on another kind of a school, you know, because it gives you uh, the possibility of understanding the relationship between design and business, design and manufacturing, design and production, and uh, all, all these particular aspects, uh, the, the experimental aspect of design, so you have the time to do it, uh, you have a better critics, you know, you have better teachers, so um, it's, you have a, a university, a universal kind of a training that is important for doing a little thing like that. <laughs> you know? It's amazing, you need an entire universal training to do it, just a little thing like that. <laughs> you know, and this is why it's important that the education of designers is at the university level, not at the vocational level. You, there's nothing wrong about having vocational school, it's fine for assistants, uh, you know, that doesn't want to be anything else but to be the best assistant, it's fine. You know? um, I have a great praise for best uh, graphic designer assistant, but that's what they, they are, and they shouldn't be much more. Um, to be a designer, you need a more education, and if you didn't get it in school, you can always get it by yourself. <laughs> well, the, this fabulous Macintosh box in front of me, it is indeed the most seductive tool ever invented. Seduction is a great thing, you know, it's terrific, you know, but you have to be in, in control of it. And if you do that, then the computer is a fantastic tool. Actually, it is the most fantastic tool ever invented for doing graphic design, you know, by, by, there's nothing else, really. Never since Gutenberg, 14, the end of 1400, uh, from the beginning of typography, from the beginning of type, movable type, there has never been anything that uh, could contribute more to sublime typography as the computer can do. But also it's true, there is nothing that can contribute more to the most horrible typography that has ever been possible. Because it depends on the user, the whole thing, you know, finally. With movable type, with the lead, you know, and before, there, was a, there were limitations, the things you can do, cannot do. There is no limitation anymore with a computer, you can do anything. But because you can do anything, then now you can do the kerning, for instance, that you couldn't do before when the type was made of lead because of the shoulder. Now, you know, well, the best they could do was with Helvetica, they had no shoulder. So you could put the type letters one close to the other. Now with the computer you can put type letters 
you're kerning any way you want, one, even in top, one in top of the other if you want to. So you can do uh, anything, or you can space them out as, as much as you want, you know, with a very easy click or two, you know, and that's it. So you can do things that you never in the past you could do so easily and so uh, well. And so that's why computer allows you to do the, the most beautiful typography ever. However, as I said, the problem is that there are all these people doing desktop publishing, for instance, you know, and, uh, you know, newsletters and things like that, without any training on typography, without any training in graphic design, but the computer allows them to do it. What I say all the time, if desktop publishers would be doctors, we would be all dead by now. <laughs> you know? yeah, no. Well, I was very lucky with the National Park Service because I had a terrific client to begin with. You know, my client was Vincent Gleason at the time, he was director of publication for the National Park Service. And so it was the guy that was in charge of all the things which are printed. <laughs> and it's a lot of things. When you think you have 375 national parks and every park has a map, book, catalogs or things like that, you know, publications, signage, and tremendous amount of need of, in terms of uh, publications. So what, what happened is that Vincent Gleason uh, heard me to speak about grids, and then he came over and said, can you do something for us, for national parks? And so we said, okay, let's, let's, let's start a format for the national parks, and this is exactly what we have done. So there is a format for the posters, you know, there is a grid for that, and uh, there is an identification band at the top, you know, the black band with the name of the park, and then there is a, a system of information that travels horizontally. So there is a band for titles, a band for text, a band for pictures, or, you know, and so on. So all this simplified the entire operation of making them and puts it some discipline into, into that. Um, the problem before was that <coughs> they didn't have particular setup of, of discipline, so everything was fine, and every time you have to do something, you don't know where to start. You know. Now, by having a grid, by having a discipline, by having stabilized the typefaces you know, into two typefaces, one for reading, one for headlines, you know, the number of choices being much less than before, it becomes easier to, to work, you know, th that is a practical consideration. Then we establish uh, sets for a cartography. There are five different levels of cartography, you know, from uh, geographical maps to bird's eye views of maps to schematic maps. We look all the best examples in the world in terms of uh, uh, geographical maps. You know, and we find out that the Swiss one were the nicest one, <laughs> as usual. You know, in the United States, it doesn't have a good tradition in terms of maps. Isn't it? Rand McNally maps are ugly, horrible, compared to... It, today, it's totally unjustifiable that ugliness can exist, because you have perfect examples done around the world by one guy or another, and so you just have to understand what is the best way of doing it, and you do it better. So um, then we establish, you know, guideline for writing, guideline for, for uh, taking photographs, guideline for illustrations. So there was a whole set of guidelines, not rigid, very flexible, you know, but uh, you will use every time whatever is most appropriate, but you will not use something which is not appropriate, <laughs> you know which is always the danger, and uh, no matter what, you know. And, uh, and then the, the very good designers which were there at the National Parks Office, they did the implementation. And I was going there, you know, at the beginning, every three, four, five, six months, you know, and examine everything that was done, and I would say a critique. We would have all the things there and say, that is great, uh, this could be better, don't do that anymore, you know, things like that, you know, so that until, you know, a certain level was achieved, 
and and then they went on by themselves very well, you know, uh, with great professionalism, which is what it's all about, you know. Okay. Embellishment to begin with is something which you add, and you can never get good by adding. You can only get good by subtracting. You know? Of course, where do we learn it? We learn it from our masters, you know, from Laws, from Mies, you know, and less is more was Mies. <laughs> but he, he learned it on his own terms from people before him as well, you know. And, um, you know, it's amazing. People think that less is more, for instance, he, he, you can only go through minimalism. It's not true. You can get that even in the most Baroque kind of uh, architecture. Borromini, for instance, uh, you know, fabulous master of Baroque architecture, um, in a sense was less is more. It was less because the, the kind of shapes, the control that he has is very essential to an idea and it's the less distance between the idea and the result. And that is less, less is more. Okay. That, what gives to graphic design the sense of ephemeral, you know, is the fact that it's been approached in ephemeral ways, you know. If you t do things just be because I like it, that kind of a thing, you know, that kind of attitude, of course it lasts for like a breath. You know, for a moment, that's it. You have to do graphic designer as it will be built in concrete and steel, so that it was, will, will last for thousands of years, you know, as long as possible. Because the paper might go away, but the idea will never fail. That is timeless. Designers could be uh, fabulous, it is a fabulous profession, but if you don't perform it and you don't practice it at the highest level, it becomes very meaningless, very transitory, just a job. And it shouldn't be, because it offers just the, oppos the opposite. It offers the, the possibility of being a sublime thing, if you leave it that way. And, uh, and you were talking about the ego. Yes, fine, the ego helps. It helps you to design in such a way that your design might last for a thousand years. I mean, we have examples of things done by the Egyptians are 5,000 years old. The, the graphic designer or artist that was doing those things on the wall, he wasn't looking for getting published in next week magazine. <laughs> no. He just thought that he had to do the things he was doing the best way he could do it. And uh, that's why he survived so long. And that was not ephemeral. So why should be our design ephemera? There's no, no excuse. <laughs>